Hey, Bobby Manning, episode 48 of Dome Theory is here. Want to give you an update first on what we're going to be doing here in the weeks to come on this show. We have a line of interviews coming up every Monday is what I'm going to be hitting on. Aiming to get those out in live stream format so you can see them direct, raw, to the point, and have great conversations live with your questions on the air so you can see what's going on with our conversations with some great people who went from aspiring to do something to doing it, which is what we talk about here on the show. But there's also a lot of other stuff we want to talk about as well. Today, of course, everybody's mind on the Derek Chauvin verdict out of Minnesota. We'll get to that in one second. Uh, but first, Monday, interview day, we will be doing music culture discussions on Friday, and those collectively will come out on Monday. So you'll get the Friday weekend edition. It might go to Saturday, depending on when game nights are. And then you'll have our interview for Monday packed into one podcast. So you can listen to one thing throughout the week that's timely. I think that's going to be the best schedule to do this, as well as the best way to fit it into our streaming schedule and CLNS Media. So make sure you subscribe to Dome Theory on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, wherever you get your podcast, we're there. And you'll listen to it all of our streams, all of our discussions, as well as some bonus interview content occasionally that we're going to be throwing into that podcast stream if you're subscribing to it. Uh, so keep an eye on that. W what I'm trying to do is keep it to one episode every week. Might be multiple interviews. It might be multiple takes, might be multiple things packed within, probably end up being an hour or just above that. Uh, but you're going to be able to skip through it, get what you want, uh, and just have it all in one place so you're not getting bam bombarded with podcast episodes throughout the week or missing them or uh, having them end up in spots where you're probably not going to listen and then have some other podcasts jump in front of that one. So that's our plan. We're releasing this one midweek, so we're already off to a great start, but I do have to hit on the Derek Chauvin verdict, which was released after the interview that we did here today with Noah Eagle. Jarring moment. It was shocking to a lot of people, I believe, to see an officer not only convicted of murder, but to have that visual. And, you know, in these cases, you don't always have a camera in there, but in this COVID environment and given the scale and interest in the case, the judge there, Peter Cahill, decided to have cameras in the courtroom throughout this one. So that made a compelling trial to follow. And I ended up being that I'm working here at home in the Casa, watched just about every minute of this trial. And some things stood out to me. I know a lot of people are taking this in from that final visual. And the visual was powerful of Chauvin getting all three guilty verdicts thrown at him and then getting slapped in cuffs. There were two, I think, right there, there was three great lines in this trial the former MMA fighter, witness, and person who was yelling at Chauvin on the scene that day, saying that he had a call of the police on the police. He said that line a couple times. That is a certainly poetic moment from this case, as well as the prosecutor Blackwell, Ryan Blackwell, I think was his name, uh, saying that George Floyd didn't die because his heart was too big. Floyd died because Derek Chauvin's heart was too small. But there was still that seed of doubt within the American public that a police officer, even in a case with his video, even in a case where the killing was brutal in a way that resonated around the world to people who might not even sympathize with this issue or believe it to be an issue. So that drew this out to a scale where the entire world was able to protest. And due to the COVID pandemic, many people weren't bound to work. There was mass unemployment numbers. There was a free time and a lack of distraction in the world at that point that allowed it to become a moment where we could have grasped and pushed for bigger systematic change in this place. And that's what stuck with me as I watched this trial. So there was a couple of takeaways I had after Chauvin got convicted 
And I'm going to share them with you. But this moment here, if you're watching the video version, and we'll play it of him getting the cuff slapped on him, a police officer going to jail for police misconduct for murdering a black man. The first time in Minneapolis history, history that this happened was understandably a big emotional and jarring visual for the American public to see. You don't see this, you don't expect this. And even in this case where it seemed like the evidence was so stacked against them, and as someone who did watch most of this case, it was hard to believe that this wasn't gonna be a guilty verdict given the amount of witnesses, police officers, as well as medical professionals who weighed in and said, this was undoubtedly a murder. So this is the lasting visual out of this trial that people are gonna remember for some time is one of the most anticipated trials maybe since OJ in this country. This is what we saw. So there you had it. That was the verdict. There were celebrations in the street. There was victory announced and everybody had a way in. Everybody had to say their piece on this. The Boston Celtics weighed in, of course, the NBA, the sports world was able to say how this made them feel and what the significance of this verdict was, as well as politicians. Joe Biden went live and gave a grand speech about policing in America and what this means for it, as well as in another headline, Nancy Pelosi, as well as the former girlfriend of George Floyd coming out and saying that George Floyd they thank George Floyd for sacrificing his life for justice, which we're going to get into a number of reactions to this verdict and problems I have with them. But this one, particularly from Pelosi, now Floyd's girlfriend's one thing. I get the sense of what she's saying better than what Pelosi's saying. Floyd's girlfriend said this in a way that meant he became significant. He became someone that others empathize with and put pressure on people in power to do something about and that is going to be his legacy and that's what he died for even though that quote in particular says that floyd had a decision in this and he just let himself go when in that moment we saw for those who watched that video him pleading for life him asking for help him not receiving it and that ultimately being the miscarriage of power and authority in this circumstance, it, it just it kind of miscasts what happens there. But for Pelosi to say it, when she is sitting in a position of power to be able to change these things, say something and do something significant about it as the Speaker of the House, and for a verdict that's outside her hands and ultimately won't set precedence in these circumstances we needed to see the most extreme example of police brutality police killing with multiple videos from various angles and an array of witnesses to maybe get a guilty verdict in this case nobody in the country thought that this was a slam dunk and you throughout this trial saw the built-in legal code of the United States of America and the various states where this stuff goes on being used by the defense to cast arguments that improbably could have kept Chauvin out of jail. We think of 
the use of drugs and addiction on George Floyd's part being used as an excuse to rip life from him and dehumanize him and push the ultimate use of force in the circumstance. That argument was made by the defense. We saw his size, uncertainty, all these words were used about this moment where he was being in handcuffs, put in the car, used to justify the killing in this case. There was no doubt, little doubt throughout this that the cause of death for Floyd was the knee to the neck, the lack of oxygen, that kind of stuff. But you had an array of justifications being thrown out there that could have stood. You know, you can go back on Reddit. You can go throughout the internet for people's handbook law assessment on why it was unlikely you were going to be able to get Chauvin convicted with murder here. And who knows? There's still appeals processes here. There's still quite a few arguments that can be made that possibly could throw this case out. So that is the first reason to pause over this. If it stands, Pelosi is 100% wrong. The significance of the George Floyd trial is that it, it was a shock for in this system, the way the U.S., and its culture assess police versus black people for a jury of Floyd's peers uh, to indict a police officer for what under the law could have been justified is what's wrong here. There is a massive amount of leeway for police to kill people in this country. There is a significant uh, isolation of policing on black communities and minority communities. So those are two of the built-in reasons for these cases coming up in the first place. And then on top of that, there are a number of legal standards like qualified immunity and other things that could be aggressively pushed to be put out of the law books in this country, but haven't been because of the influence of police unions on politics the fearfulness of politicians and trying to indicate that this was a characterization of policing in America. You heard this quote throughout this, that this isn't policing. Police don't even agree with this. This is different than anything we've ever seen before. That's what the likes of Trump and others were who typically weren't going to stand up in these situations and criticize a police officer. But Progress like cameras, dash cameras, those kind of initiatives that police often push back so hard against made this one indisputable in a way that maybe others weren't. And in the time since we've seen Dante Wright die, we've seen Breonna Taylor fail to get justice in her name, despite the apparent misconduct in those cases as well, and Taylor in particular, no camera, no film. So the police are given the benefit of the doubt in those situations. And legally in this country, in mass, police are still given the benefit of the doubt in the moment, in the courtroom, and then beyond that. Misconduct often leads to release of duties in one location and then the ability to move on to duty in a different location, as we saw in that Florida case at the time. Sometimes accountability in their circumstances is a retirement, a reassignment of duty. Hey, I mean, countless uh, police in this country who have killed black people in controversial ways have been put back on the job. Rayshard Brooks's killer in Atlanta is an example you can look back on from that whole George Floyd protest summer. So these are the kind of things that you come out of this. And it's fantastic that George Floyd got justice, which is what was done here. Justice under this legal system was a surprise and shocked many. 
but it's not changing that legal system. Now, Floyd did move the needle in some kind of way that is certainly historic, but that change has been slow. It is seen a thousand people per year die in this country in the hands of police. And so Floyd's justice isn't bringing him back. It, it will hopefully make his family feel better, his loved ones, as well as the community of Minneapolis that I think has worked hard on this issue. Uh, they moved to defund the police and move assets into other locations. Uh, we saw in the Brooklyn Center killing of Dante Wright last week, the chief let go, the city manager let go, and the mayor, who is Black, be a vocal advocate of what protesters and people in the streets there wanted last summer. And that is something I take out of this as well. The significance of rioting, protesting, whatever you want to call it. My friend Anthony Doyle here on Twitter says this doesn't happen without riots. Yes, riots, not protests last summer. Don't let anyone fucking tell you that rioting won't work. Disrupting the system is how you get its attention. And we can parse words over what this entails. But ultimately, the pressure of unrest in the streets, stepping on doorsteps of elected officials, being in these meetings and confronting these elected officials, anything that was done to confront power last summer certainly had an impact here. And so that is one of the lasting lessons out of this one that is valid. America, the media, politicians can say, go to the sidewalk at this time and then go home at seven o'clock and everything will be all good. But who is power in this country to define what protests look like? That has always sat unwell with me and it's ugly. Sometimes property is destroyed. Occasionally small businesses suffer massive damage and have to shut down. And those are tragic circumstances, but that's small in the whole scale of moral wrongdoing in this country compared to the justification of allowing the state to kill people just by casting criminality on people. And that's the other side to this as well. What else did we hear in this trial? Floyd did drugs. Floyd used a fraud $20 bill that allowed the police in the first place to encroach upon him and find all these other issues that he's gone through in his life. And then each of those issues were magnified and attempted to be used as justification for killing him. And that's what we see with the legal system in the US. It's so vast, it's so built on being able to access people's private lives, confront them in traffic stops, which we saw go tragically here. Now, I don't pretend to have the answer to any of this stuff, but I do know that we have to reassess it and think about the system rather than the individual cases. Why does the system in the US allow a thousand people to be killed by police when that doesn't happen anywhere else in the developed world? Why is it so difficult to convict and take police officers out of the line of duty when wrongdoing is committed? And I think people across this country right now can agree that the police in many circumstances are misusing their power, but the legal system at large doesn't have the power to strip them of their power. And why is that? That has to change. And George Floyd dying to send one police officer to prison, it isn't the final answer to that problem. In fact, it doesn't even address the problem. It just allows us to feel good about ourselves. And I think that's a big problem with America right now. I'm not gonna take away the good feeling and the accomplishment and the work that was done by people to achieve this guilty verdict, that is certainly progress. But what level of progress is it in the grand scheme of things? And where does it go from here? That's what has to be answered. How much better are we going to feel about America if 
George Floyd's continues to happen across the country in years to come because there wasn't enough change affected out of this circumstance. This has to be used as a moment to capitalize. And certainly I think many cities and municipalities across the country did within the last year, but it can't be a moment of resting, complacency. And so what bothers me most out of this week is the report from Axios about this administration that I think has been complacent at times on a number of issues due to its popularity and due to its ability to put money in people's pockets early on in the administration. And frankly, this campaign slogan and mission statement from the president that I'm not Trump. So that's all that matters. So the report from Axios yesterday is that Chauvin verdicts reduce pressure for police reform. The unanimous guilty verdicts against Eric Chauvin are a huge relief for Washington's political establishment, but seem unlikely to rush in the system at systemic overhauls George Floyd's family and civil rights leaders and progressive leaders seek. An acquittal and mistrial involving the foreign police officer would have unleashed violence and days more of protest. This is what they're worried about in Washington and at the governmental level. How can we maintain peace, stability, and the status quo? Not what can get broader reforms done in a timely manner. What better time than now when the Senate, the House, and the presidency are in democratic hands? What better time than now? We're going to make something good come out of this tragedy. Again, this notion on America's part that one surprise verdict is going to bring down the driving train of white supremacy in this country. And the intersectionality of this issue is important to consider because I don't want to make this podcast a driving condemnation of policing as a whole. Because guess what? There are a million guns in every state and the prevalence of those guns is what has allowed the police army state to be built up and empowered and look like the U.S. Army rolling through streets at times. And that in some part is on account of the proliferation of guns throughout this country. And that is another devious tactic that has allowed the police state, the carceral state to be built up in the country the way that it has and to have mass numbers of gun violence take people on this country. And at this point in the past month, there have been numerous mass shootings. And what's being done to address that? Again, with the massive victory that this country handed the Democratic Party that says to be in favor of all these things and be pushing to work on these matters. And so they're coming at it, this administration is coming at reportedly through Axios in a standpoint of, oh, we don't have to do this now because the demand isn't there, the pressure isn't there on us. This is just my take on this from seeing how power acts in this country. Just last week, different example, the Biden administration was heavily criticized for rolling back refugee intake in this country. And people saw that, they identified that, they blasted it out on a wider scale and made the administration change course on that. 
same can be done here. Instead of looking at the George Floyd verdict and saying, victory, mission accomplished. We can look at a report like that from Axios and say, oh, so George Floyd's going to have a legacy here, but you reportedly are using this as a excuse to get out of doing difficult change, getting rid of qualified immunity, passing this George Floyd police bill, and perhaps being deemed by a different group in this country as police haters or all the tropes that get thrown on anybody in favor of police reform in this country. That was a massive issue last summer when any idea of change was just hit back with, oh, you're anti-police. Blue lives matter, this kind of stuff that is done to delegitimize the other side. And Democrats are scared of that. They are terrified. Them and Republicans lean heavily on police, money, votes, organizing to maintain their positions at every level. And this is the difficult thing about this. You have state police at the state level. They are dictating a lot of times who's in office across the country on a state level. And then on a local level, certainly they are some of the biggest power players in local politics. And frankly, this is a local level issue. And so last summer to see organization being done at a local level was so important. And you did see some change done in certain municipalities across the country. But then you have to put that against crime rates and these other issues in the country that frankly need to be addressed in a timely manner as well. So when you get into the intersectionality of this issue, that's when it becomes clear how damaging and dangerous complacency in this moment is. This issue is linked to so many others that need such urgent addressing, as particularly in this moment where people are suffering from the pandemic and numbers are starting to go back up and people are dying from that. Again, all these issues are connected. And I love Greg Popovich to bring this back to sports as we jump into this episode here. Being willing to make that connection in small part. How can we address this? How can we make change happen here? Follow the money. And in any given organization, you can follow the money, see where it goes, and see why things are the way they are. And Greg Popovich hammers that perfectly from an NBA decision. Why are sports talking about political issues in this country? Because sports owners, the power players in sports, shoe companies, Anybody who makes that world turn, they have significant pull. So Greg Popovich, after Dante Wright died, talked for five minutes and targeted the reason all this stuff is going on in this country and where we need to look. And the articles have been written about this in some part already, where NBA money goes and what kind of causes it supports contrasted against the image of a progressive league that's doing everything it can to solve these issues. And some on the other side might even say too much is being done on that front. Well, if you look at the facts here, that might not actually be the truth. And do these people want a country or not? Do these people have grandchildren? Do they want their grandchildren to go to work, to go to school and go through these drills and worry about being murdered? What does it take to care more about them than your frickin' power and your position and your donors? And with policing, it's the same damn way. How many young black kids have to be killed for no frickin' reason? How many? So that we can empower the police unions. We need to find out who funds these people. I wanna know what owners in the NBA fund these people who perpetrate these lies. Maybe that's a good place to start. So it's all transparent. Yeah, so important. So important. That's everything we're talking about right here. 
And did that change because George Floyd's killer was convicted? No. One of those organizations in question here are putting a PR front out so that they can have a paragraph of PR speak replace action and pointed ideas for how to change this thing. We're going to pass sentiment over policy. And what way did that ring, ring truer yesterday than the LA or the Las Vegas Raiders tweeting this out? I can breathe. That is the mission accomplished banner of social justice PR. And they left it up. Now, there are a number of things wrong here. Beyond the fact that research wasn't done to see that police in the aftermath of the Eric Garner killing, I believe it was. Counter protesters in support of the NYPD wore shirts of the same slogan in an apparent reference to Eric Garner. So that's the first thing wrong here. They probably just needed a Google search to reveal. But beyond that, this isn't what happened here. George Floyd said, I can't breathe and died. What happened in court is literally the opposite of this. It did nothing to bring him back to life. And more George Floyds will happen because this is what you're doing with your money, resources, and audience. You're putting out a misguided tweet that convinces America, particularly white America, your fan base, your paying customers, that we're all good here. Everything's fine. Mission accomplished. In fact, I can breathe. George Floyd's back. That is not what happened here. And ultimately, let's be real. If you dig into the facts of this case, law in Minnesota, they talked about Bradley, the Bradley case, where sentencing is based on your past criminal history. And since police aren't convicted of crimes and law enforcement is isolated on black communities and putting people in a system, a carceral state, and having them rotated in and out of it, your sentencing is based on your past record. So it is the expectation that Chauvin will serve 12 to 15 years for crimes that carry as many as 40 in one instance. And how is that going to make people feel when that is announced in eight weeks? Now, there are other ways the judge can go to push that upward, and the prosecutors are certainly doing that. But like I said from the very beginning here, the prosecutors in this case had to come at it from a standpoint of policing is good. It is a noble institution in this country. And this one guy stepped out of line there. This isn't a greater issue. This case isn't about a bigger issue at hand here. This is about one guy who you need to convict. And I understand the legal strategy behind that. But that, in turn, is another reason I look at the legal profession and say, a lot of people go toward it to try to change these things but instead end up having to adapt to a system that maintains these things. How are we going to have a case where the argument in order to win had to say, this isn't a statement on policing at large in this country. So how is policing at large in this country going to change? One guy who was already fired by his department is going to jail for some amount of time while the rest of the world spins on and Dante writes, Brianna Taylor's, and others are continuing to be pulled out of it. There's a number of reasons 
why that will continue to happen that we can talk about it another time. But I just want people to think and critically analyze what happened this week. I'm not saying it's not a victory. I am saying it is not mission accomplished. And rest in peace to George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and Dante Wright.